Those who were called skillful leaders of old knew how to drive a wedge between the enemy's front and rear. Uh, in short, when the, enemy's end were, ends were, when the enemy's men were united, they managed to keep them in disorder. So, keep your opponent off the balance. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I just you just get excited about this. <laughs> I do, I do get excited about this. This was my manual for running the philosophy department for ten years. It's probably why people hated me. <laughs> but I was very effective. Um, but yes, I kept those unbalanced people off balance. <laughs> that's my favorite. Uh, that's my favorite rule here. And so, uh, yeah, basically, try to sow dissent in the opposing ranks. <laughs> you can see this happening all the time, actually, in politics, where people try to suggest that their own party is unified, but the opposing party has all these divisions, and you play up some of those divisions. Um, so. Gosh, let's see, on the Republican side, there are obviously <coughs> divisions on all sorts of issues. And so you, if you're on the other side, you try to play that up and, you know, try to keep your opponents fighting each other over immigration policy or this or that or the other thing, while you advance in a united way. Of course, they're going to be trying to do the same to you, trying to sow dissent on your side. Now, in a business context, what can this mean? Well, partly it's involving uh, a matter of, you know, sort of, keeping your own moves secret, practicing deception, and this type of thing. But to some extent, also, it's to try to, hmm, well, yeah, how would you do this, actually? Suppose you're in an organization that does have competition. How would you keep the competition off balance? How could you do it? I mean, just do, do things that aren't normal for you. Like, like confuse Ooh. them by doing something not normal for you. Like Good. UT, like don't throw, don't throw the screen, and you know, change up what you always do. That's gonna confuse them. Good. Okay. Yeah. One way of putting this is just confuse your opponent, and that is partly to, yeah, hide what you're doing, but also to do things to deflect, to deflect, to confuse. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And so this is very close to one of my rules, which is when in doubt. Oops. <laughs> Complicated. <laughs> because you'll know what you're doing, and the other person won't know what you're doing. Um, it's sort of the equivalent of, you know, enemy uh, missiles are coming, and so you throw up all of these little metal things to try to confuse the missiles, right? Smoke, yes, blow smoke. And that's sort of what I did in that meeting. I think people were utterly confused, and in the end, I was fortunate. A couple of people said things that helped me. And I was able to use that, and in the end, yes, I succeeded <laughs> against what seemed to be overwhelming odds. And if I had gone in saying, here's what I think we ought to do, I would have been clobbered. Um, however, I complicated the picture so much, and I knew what to watch for. In a sense, I was like throwing all these things in the air, people were watching them, and I knew which ball to actually pay attention to, it, and so on, nobody else did. So you might think, well, part of this is, well, if you're smarter than the other guy, this helps me. Or if you're not smarter than the other guy, the difference is you know what to look for. You understand what the real factor is. So you know what's a fake and what's real, but the other person doesn't know. Yeah? What about when it comes to business, innovating to keep your opponent off balance? So good. You might announce a bunch of different product lines that you're developing, and one is the real and the others are fake. Mm -hmm. You might say, yeah, we're working on this, we're working on that. And actually, and you might have to do a little bit, right? You have a team and you say, you guys go out and think about blah, blah, blah. But actually, one of those is the thing you're serious about. The others are meant to confuse the competition. Get the competition to say, wait, wait, they're starting up a new department of basket weaving? Oh, my gosh, we <laughs> did it. <laughs> and you have no intention of doing that. That's something that you do to get your, to basically distract your opponent from this new thing you're doing. And what about just in general innovate? So like the iPhone 6S, for example, has a, uh, like when you take selfies, it has like a flash on the screen, like the screen flashes. Oh yeah. So they innovate, which keeps the competition off balance because they didn't think about that. Oh, right. Good, yeah. Do the unexpected and innovate in unexpected ways. Yeah. 
So that is a good way. No, it, all they did was sell the public on a feature they don't need. That's how right. they're staying ahead. Well, that was actually not it. <laughs> that was just an example, but like Siri, Siri, when Siri came out. That right. Well, also they're selling the public on a feature they they developed years ago that they're slowly rolling out. Right. Like everything on the iPhone, I truly believe, isn't like we just came up with this. It was totally. like, no, we just want to release a new iPhone every right. year, so we need to exactly. add, add new We have features. to add at least a feature. But it's a business exactly, plan. Yeah. No, yeah, but I think that's on your level, well, though. cars do that, too. Yeah, like yeah. I think, but I think it's along what you're saying. It's just shady as shit. Yeah. About, like, legal language. <laughs> but it still, like, gives a competition balance. Like, yeah, no, for sure. Look at yeah. the examples, like, when the Apple introduced the iPhone in itself. Right. That right. completely revolutionized the industry, so that took the uh, competition off balance. Like, BlackBerry didn't see it coming, no one saw it coming. Poor BlackBerry. Mm -hmm. but, yeah, it's sad. It is Blackberries sad. Blackberries were actually really I good. loved the yeah. BlackBerry. Yeah. 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 It was such a long time. Me too, so did I. I put it off and put it off and, put, and they just they couldn't get there. <laughs> well, are there rules we should add to this? Actually, maybe you've got one here. Innovate. That is a way of keeping your opponent off balance, so maybe we could add that here. Innovate, even if the innovation isn't really very important. Yeah, it keeps... It just causes a sense of innovation. It's a new color, or it's a new, like, really? That's right, yes. Yeah. Well, sometimes it doesn't yeah, they've work. they've done that before. I mean, Reynolds wrap with their plastic wrap, I don't think they're even in that business anymore. But when they were, they had this idea of coming out with colors. Oh, um, I remember that. And Christmas it was a big deal. Yeah, and then... But who wants to take their leftovers and wrap them in red. green yeah. oil or something? Yeah. It made everything look unappetizing. So <laughs> it quickly disappeared. So, I mean, innovate. I really want to add wisely. <laughs> if it's irrelevant, like something that flashes but really doesn't do anything, that may keep the opposition off balance and be worth doing. But if it actually makes your product worse, it's probably not a good idea. Uh, are there rules we ought to add to all of this? Be smart. Be smart. Okay, good. I mean, I was, I was gonna, <laughs> yeah. I wasn't really being here. Well, uh, there is something I really <laughs> want to get in here that is already, in a sense, on the board when we talked about the importance of flexibility. But that is, yeah, attend <laughs> to your OODA loop. An OODA loop. Yeah. Does anybody know what an OODA loop is? No, but I love it. Okay. <laughs> I know what OODA is. Yeah. Now I'm trying to remember what the... Oh, those are. <laughs> yeah. Well, this, this part is act, okay? This part is decide. This part is orient. Organize? Um, it's observe, orient, decide. Observe, class. orient. Thank you. I knew there was something that... Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Google. Observe. Yeah, I realized I had these notes that I didn't bring. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, and I was thinking, that's okay, I remember everything until I... Ow. But yes, observe, orient, decide, act. Now here's why it's a loop. Because, now, observe. <laughs> oh my god, I love this. This is the part where you basically say, uh-huh, I've got to pay attention to my environment. That's both the fixed part and the changing part. And then I have to orient myself... That is to say, realize what this means for me, how this affects my plan, my means of getting to my vision. So I've got a certain goal, and I know what the goal is, but now I've got to observe the circumstances. Then I have to say, okay, now how do I pursue that goal in these circumstances? Given my alternatives, then I decide. And once I decide, I act. But now my action changes the circumstances. There's a new circumstance that results from that. And so I have to go back to observing. And this loop can sometimes start revolving very, very quickly. I'm on the battlefield, and things are changing very rapidly. One thing I like to show my undergraduate students is the Japanese battle plan for the Battle of Coral Sea. And the movements are very direct. This carrier goes here, this carrier goes there. And then you see actually what happened. And so. The battle plan is, I mean, itself somewhat complicated. It's sort of like this type of thing. But then you see what actually happened, and you realize, well, it was this, <laughs> it's this sort of incredibly messy maneuvering, and that's what really happened. And 
how quickly you can see what's happening in a rapidly changing circumstance, how well you can orient yourself to that, make a decision and act, is crucial to success. This is part of what flexibility is all about. You see the change in circumstance, you react, you respond. And so that's why I said, this is actually a pretty good interpretation of what you might mean by saying, be smart. Be smart. Recognize what's important about your circumstances, when it changes. Then figure out what that has to do with you. Then make a decision on the basis of it. Then put that into action, actually implement. And then keep observing. Yeah. The, the word act is very key in all of these principles. You can think all you want and come up with an idea, but you have to do something. So there has Absolutely to be a decision right. to say, say okay, I'm not going to have stage fright. Yes. I'm going to go ahead and do it. So that's a good piece there to remind that's us you have to act. Exactly right. Um, <laughs> in fact, it's for this reason, I think, that C.S. Lewis said, Courage is the most important mm -hmm. virtue. Why? Because you've got to have the courage to act on what mm -hmm. you decide. Mm -hmm. um, I was somebody who was a very successful investor for about 20 years until the collapse of the dot-com bubble, which I didn't see coming. Mm -hmm. And ever since then, I've been afraid to act. So I will sometimes draw the conclusion that this is a good time to invest, or this is a good time to sell. But I often don't act because I don't trust my own instincts any longer. I don't trust my own conclusions. And so is it... It may be that I become a coward because of that incident, but it may just be that, look, for all sorts of reasons, you might second-guess yourself. Mm -hmm. And so you're absolutely right. Getting from the decision to actually doing it sounds trivial, but it's not. Mm -hmm. In an organization, it's even harder because it's not just that one individual has to marshal up the courage and the willingness, the confidence to act, but you've got to get an entire organization to do something. Mm -hmm. And that requires mobilizing people. It requires implementing policies. It requires... Uh, you know, having whole teams of people actually accomplish something. So you're absolutely right. This is actually where a huge amount of attention ought to be paid. It's hard once you've made a decision to actually make it happen. But often what happens is that an organization just has, a, is too slow about this. It's very slow at adapting. And I think the larger an organization is, the harder it is. Let's say you and a partner start a company. Well, it's very easy to make a decision. Say, hey, guess what, blah, 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 you talk on the phone, a decision is made, you implement it. But now you've got, let's say, after growing for 10 years and being very successful, you've got 5,000 employees. Way harder to actually gather the relevant information. Way harder to orient and figure out what that means for your company. Much harder to actually reach a decision, because now it's not just you and your partner talking on the phone, it's a complicated thing. And then actually putting it out that into practice may be very difficult. And then gathering information about the results, that may take a long time. So in a lot of industries, this happens unbelievably slowly. And a lot of success is really just making this happen fast. <laughs> Greasing the wheels and making sure that happens. Um, we talked about the strength of organizations, methods. And all of this really might be part of the method thing in Sun Tzu, really. You've got to have a method that actually allows you to do this and do this rapidly. Now, some situations don't change very quickly. Universities. I mean, it's not like things change very rapidly most of the time. Um, though they could. I mean, it's possible. I guess the University of Missouri this week has seen rapid changes. Yeah. Um, so sometimes that sort of thing happens. But most of the time, it's okay for a university to go slow. Um, because in a certain sense, nothing big is likely to happen quickly to us. On the battlefield, it's important that a military unit be able to do this very, very rapidly. In politics, it often pays to have this happen very, very rapidly because circumstances can change things dramatically. Um, in a given organization, it depends. You have to think how quickly do these changing aspects of the environment that affect us change. And sometimes it's pretty fast. And so you have to be able to adapt quickly. Um, you might say one of the things that you have to decide about your fixed environment is how much, how much does this stuff affect us? Um, I'm thinking a football team again. Put, you have a domed stadium. You might say this doesn't affect us that much. <laughs> as long as people can get to the stadium, we're okay. Um, but if it's an open stadium, then gosh, this stuff may matter a lot. Uh, how many people are going to come to the game might depend on what the weather is, how cold it is, how hot it is, etc. And so maybe there are ways of insulating yourself from some of these changes, 
But if there is a rapidly changing environment, you better be able to adapt to that. And I think a lot of bureaucracies become very bad at adapting. Mm -hmm. Their OODA loops slow down. And sometimes they stop altogether. I mean, the things that a company ought to be observing, do they even observe it? Um, Austin Energy, about 15 years ago, had some consultants come in. Uh, they did all these competitive analysis things. The consultants said, you're a regulated utility. You don't need to analyze the competition. Just stop gathering all that information on your customers and on your competitors and so on. They took the unit that actually did all of that. They broke it up and assigned the people to other things. So then, for about 10 years, they just didn't gather all this sorts of information. They weren't observing. Then a new leader took over and said, where's all this information? <laughs> How do we compare to our competitors on this? How are our costs compared to Texas utilities? And, and what about our customers? How have our customers been changing in the past year? And people say, um, I don't know. <laughs> they told us to stop collecting any of that information. Uh, it was an unbelievably stupid thing. Mm -hmm. My general view is that consultants usually say unbelievably stupid things. <laughs> uh, but in any event, that's just based on my own observations in various organizations, but almost always the consultant doesn't know nearly as much as you know about your organization. Ends up saying foolish things. In any event, it might be that one of these just breaks down, but it could, it's often just the case it slows down. It becomes hard to do. Well, anything else that we should add to Sun Tzu's list or elaborate about? Really, I'm glad you added people because I'm thinking in terms of diversity and how we've been talking about that a lot lately. And I can see how that cycle, that loop, can get slow, and that you, you may actually have a um, board of trustees, for example, and you all know each other, and you've been organ, you know, the, the leaders of the organization for years, and you don't have new energy, you don't have new people, new thoughts, and you get stagnant. And so right. that that could Oh, okay, you know, good. Stuck. Yeah, exactly. If you think in terms of the diversity of an organization here, what do you think Sun Tzu would say? When is it a good thing and when is it not a good thing? When it's about um, keeping your opponent off balance, I guess having different perspectives, you have a, some different creative ideas, but then on the flip side, if you're not a homogenous organization and you have too much diversity, you're not being able to find the same um, vision, then it could become a problem. So. Oh, exactly. Good. So let's say we pursue diversity by having people who don't share the vision. Um, that would be bad. In the military context, that's like, let's have a bunch of spies you know, from the other side. That would be bad. So, so diversity of vision would not be a strike. That would be bad. People don't share our goals. On the other hand, you might say, look, it does maybe make us a lot more flexible and a lot less predictable. And so here, it would seem to be a big plus to have people who are um, actually uh, going to make our, our organization more complex and make us less predictable. For example, suppose we've got, and actually a lot of industries have developed this way. People are brought up in the industry. They stay there their whole careers. Um, they make a certain set of decisions. They become highly predictable because everybody thinks of things the same way. And having new blood in that context can be a huge benefit. And so the auto industry at a certain stage was probably like this. I think you could argue higher education is like this. I think lots of lots of things get bogged down, especially when those OODA loops become slow. Um, people start doing things just because that's the way you do it. <laughs> so there it's a huge advantage. Um, if you think in terms of values, having people who don't share the values is probably a negative. But people who have different strengths and different weaknesses are going to strengthen you because some can compensate for others. So here I think it's going to be a big plus. Having people whose tendencies are different so that you've actually got people who are, again, going to make the situation more flexible, a little less predictable, that's a big plus. Um, if you think about things like this, you want people, not all who have the same strength and the same talent, right? Um, usually you want people whose talents are going to Balance one another. If this person's a great researcher but a bad teacher, good thing to have a good teacher, even if that person's research isn't so great, to keep the organization strong in various ways. Um, diversity of morale. Do we think, gosh, we're all too happy. Let's bring in some depressed. <laughs> I mean, their diversity is probably a bad thing, unless, of course, we're all depressed, and then maybe we need to bring in some, some things. Again, diversity of motivation. Well, no, we'd like ourselves to be all pretty highly motivated and dedicated and so on, so there it's not so good, engaged. Um, 
But now different degrees of investment. That actually might be a good thing, right? Do we want everybody all in on this project? In some cases, yeah. But in some other cases, you might think, I want some people who can give greater perspective. Exactly, step back a little bit. So there, I think, at least lots of times, that'll be a plus. And, and so, yeah, actually, one of the things I really like about this is that it lets you think about that in a much more refined way and say, in a lot of contexts, absolutely, yes, that really adds to the strength. In some other contexts, no. Um, we don't want people who are just not going to share our goals. If, our, if we think our organization is about... And then, let's say, it's in fitness. We think we're about getting Austin fit. And then we bring in a bunch of people who say, well, no, actually, I, I don't think it's about that, you know. <laughs> um, or, you're at part. actually, this really happened in a musical organization that uh, I was part of. You know, people were really devoted to having this do as good a job as possible, real excellence. And somebody came in and basically said, look, I just want everybody to have fun. That's a different sort of goal, and it's going to change the organization pretty dramatically. And if everybody else says, I don't care about having fun, I want to really be excellent, then actually that's, that's going to be a problem. So in short, you want people with a diversity of strengths and all these other things, but not necessarily a diversity of vision. You want them to be on board. And you want the leader to be able to... Yeah. That, that's right. <laughs> that's right. It makes it... In a sense, if, if people are... If all of this is more complex, it does make the task of leadership sometimes harder uh, because it's harder to actually create circumstances where people cooperate and are pulling in the same direction. But the end goal can be, you know, what's your, what, what, you might know your enemy more, more, you might be more effective in terms of knowing who your competition is because on your team you have people who maybe are from that country or they live that experience and they can give you that insider knowledge, you know, having having that diversity within your organization can have a lot, will, will have a lot of positives. That's true, that's true. In a way it makes it a little harder to know yourself maybe, but mm -hmm. easier to know your enemy mm -hmm. and your circumstances. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and, and in a certain sense actually maybe making it easier to know yourself. Your, your whole organization will be more complex, mm -hmm. but it may be that that Diversity of perspectives is actually going to help you realize your own strengths and weaknesses and so on. There may be tendencies you didn't see because everybody there shared the same tendencies. Right. So, so yes, it can sort of work uh, in, both, in both directions, but often it will, will be a